very pretty. <laughs> Please don't. I love you. Hey, what's going on? You're now tuned in to the PVD Horror Podcast. I'm Brandon, and I'm joined by my co-host Dave and our good friend Mark of the Midnight Social Distortion Podcast. Today, we have a special guest. He is an award-winning author of horror, dark fantasy, and science fiction. Joining us today is Paul Tremblay. Paul, thanks for coming on the show, man. Hey, thanks. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Uh, Hopefully, I'm not too dour, because today was like my first day back at school, so I'm kind of like depressed wow, wow. No, yeah. <laughs> but it'll be all right like after the first yeah. week it's like uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah if you like all things horror and want to get the best horror news interviews and reviews like subscribe and ring that bell to follow us and satisfy all your horror needs <laughs> so now paul our friend mark is a really big fan of your work he actually oh that's so nice to hear yeah he recommended one of your books to me once once i was locked in i noticed a lot of hometown references i then had to look you up and realize that you were from mm-hmm. mass and that you're very often in Providence, Rhode Island. So uh, that was that was a great connection for me. So can you share some of your experiences, like, you know, being in Providence at times? Yeah, yeah. So I ended up going to Providence College uh, for, for college. Nice. <laughs> and I laugh because, you know, I teach now and, I, you know, I tell the students, you know, applying to school when I was like way back in 1989 is so different than now. Like I chose Providence because I like their basketball team. I think they had made the final, they had made the final four in 1987. So I'm like, oh. Yeah, they have a good basketball team, yeah. and that was the best school I got into. So I ended up in Providence. Um, but you know, I had a great time. It was really the place like I didn't have a good time in high school, where I sort of discovered myself or felt more comfortable being myself. You know, and I did stuff like the the radio station, and you know, and things like played a lot of intramural basketball. Uh, so I know Providence always has like a special you know place in my heart. And you know, I live in Massachusetts, but almost perfectly in between Boston and Providence. So. You know, I find that I go to Providence frequently and, you know, uh, you know, Providence has become like uh, a fun sort of hub for for artistic stuff, too. There's a lot of writer events and, you know, Necronomicon was just there. Yeah. Uh, And that's, you know, that's like one of the bigger conventions that I go to now. And it's, you know, every couple of years. So, yeah, no, Providence um, was definitely like a very formative as an like a a new, a brand new adult or becoming an adult, something close to an adult was was very much like part of that experience for me. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so speaking of conventions, um, I heard that you were often at Rock and Shock. Um, yeah. And you actually yeah. had like table setting up, um, selling books and stuff like that. Um, I, I I think a few times like people gave me some space, but I wasn't like standing behind a table. I never rented a table on my own. It was more oh, like okay. my friend Jack Haringa, who's a writer, critic who who lives and teaches in Worcester. I uh, had an in and he would sort of get me in. But yeah, that's where I met like Adam adam caesar uh you know and other folks where i got a picture with roddy roddy piper <laughs> so yeah oh. rock and shock certainly you know that was sort of like near the the start of my writing career i'm, too, I'm trying to remember yeah. what year that was that roddy roddy piper was there <gasps> and who like was some of the the headliners was it, that wasn't the george romero year was it or the robert england one uh i really don't remember that's fine yeah it's fine i, I remember, remember like the the musician headliners like guar was there oh, one okay. year yeah. uh but I mean, for me, Piper was a headliner. So yeah, <laughs> I was just yeah. my brother, my younger brother, and I got a picture with Roddy that I was very excited. To, that's, you that's know, cool. I still share every once in a while. So yeah, that... um, Silver Screams is going to be heading to Worcester, and you know, kind of hopefully, kind of taking on or taking over what Rock and Shock had kind of established as far, you know being like that big convention for there. Um, are you going to be checking that out? Any any chance? Um, I have to confess, I don't know. I'm not familiar with Silver Screams. Uh, okay, that sounds okay. fun. So I, I assume it's like a, a big movie convention, or is it? Is there a crossover? With, yeah, it's with actually very similar. Too? It's it's music and movies. Um, okay. Ice Nine Kills is the uh, person putting the convention together. Okay. Last year they were in Danvers, and they had oh. you know a really good turnout and some yeah. big names. This year is no different. They got like David Arquette going, um, David Howard Thorne, a bunch of uh, big names. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's going to be performing too, I believe. So it should be a good time. Nice. Sounds very cool. I'll, yeah. I'll definitely keep a, an eye out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Cool. So I'd love to hear how our guests were first introduced into the horror genre. Can you share your experience with us? Yeah. So um, somewhat aging myself, <laughs> you know, as like a <laughs> seven, eight year old, like pre cable TV. 
in the Massachusetts area, and I'm sure you could could have got could have gotten it in, in Rhode Island too. But like the, the Boston UHF channels, oh my gosh, okay. I don't yeah. even know if anyone here is old enough for that. But uh, on the weekends, Channel 56 in Boston would show they had a program called Creature Double Feature. Uh, so the first movie was always Godzilla, Gamera, you know, a kaiju movie, and then the second movie was more, uh, you know, some sort of 50s or 60s horror movie. Um, you know, and as a kid, I loved dinosaurs, so like I was instantly drawn to Godzilla. But you know, when I would watch the second movie, that movie would give me horrible nightmares. Even silly stuff like Attack of the Killer Shrews, I still remember having mm. an Attack of the Killer Shrews nightmare. So, I, I mean, I from a very young age, I was very much attracted to horror, but also just terrified of it. Like, slept with stuffed animals around my head. I shared a bedroom <laughs> with my younger brother, so he was like the canary in the coal mine for me. I would send him upstairs first if it was time for bed, and you know, if the monster in the closet didn't get him, I guess it was okay for me to go upstairs too. <laughs> so yeah, so film for me was the start. Um, soon after that, like, I felt like my town for whatever reason was an early adopter of cable TV. And, you know, back in the early and mid eighties, like HBO just showed like the same movies over and over again. So, um, you know, it was just like catching horror movies that way. My younger brother actually way outpaced me, even though he's five years younger. Uh, he was a total gore hound. Like he saw Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre when he was 10. I think I saw it for the first time, like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago because <laughs> yeah. I was too afraid to watch it. Uh, but now I love it. It's such a great movie. Um, yeah, I don't know. So it's like, it's hard to remember. It was just always there. Like, even, you know, my dad was more of a sci-fi guy, but he, you know, he had like a subscription. I remember to Omni magazine and he had like Frodo live stuff around the house and used to smoke a pipe in the house. Little mm -hmm. did I know then that it was full of, uh, <laughs> let's call it pipe weed. As opposed to, you know, they was just smoking a pipe, things you find out about your parents later. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, genre stuff was just always like a thing in my house. Uh, it was always there, which was, which was really cool. Um, I'm going to piggyback off what Brandon um, said. Um, is there like a, a specific novel, horror novel or movie or like a real life event that still has you shaking to the core to this day that still kind of like uh, makes you go like that? Oh, yeah, so many. But I mean... Uh, I mean, I mean, I guess the movie Jaws is probably the one that that still has a tangible thing. Uh, I first saw it when I was 10 years old. Um, so this is what, like 1981, I guess. And for whatever reason, like my local high school was playing it in the auditorium, but on a big screen. You know, my father pitched the movie to me. He's like, oh, this movie Jaws, it's great. There's this scene that totally captures what it feels like uh, to catch a fish on a line. Because at the time, like we would just go out in a rowboat and like go flounder fishing or something. Yeah, so the stupid kid me is like, oh, okay, let's go. <laughs> so he was right. You know, the scene where Quint, you know, was eyeing the reel, that, that was a very cool fishing moment. But he didn't prepare me for the rest of the movie. You know, when I saw <laughs> when I saw Quint's, spoiler alert for a 50-year-old movie, sorry. <laughs> but when I saw Quint, you know, get bitten in half and spilling, you know, spitting blood to the camera, that broke my brain. Um, I, I had at least like five to seven, maybe longer years of shark nightmares. Like <laughs> not exaggerating, like every, every, not every dream is a nightmare, but every nightmare it, I would end up in the water or end up with like a shark coming after me. <laughs> so, I mean, Jaws is one of my favorite movies. I've probably seen it, you know, more than 50 times. And actually I just have a, <laughs> I have a new ish tech. I can't get a good angle on this, but that's, uh, I have it's to stand there. For it's it. getting there. I have to stand there for it. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, nice. so that's, that's one of the nice. yellow barrel, one of the yellow barrel uh, bar barrels. She's a can't talk. And I just had like one of the marks look like a shark thing. Yeah. No, yeah. Awesome. It's just healed now. But so anyway, I love Jaws. But even yeah. though I when I rewatch it, I still can't watch the scene where Quint gets bitten in half. I cover my face with a pillow. Even yeah. when I've watched it with my kids, I ceremoniously cover because I'm just <laughs> afraid that if I see that scene, even though I've seen way more gory things, I'm just afraid if I see that again, my brain will return to where it was when I was 10 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that I, <laughs> what you would ask, Mark, is that's the perfect fit for me is that, <laughs> that movie, because it still has a mark, left its mark on me. Now, literally with the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Yeah. On top of that, it wasn't filmed too far away from us, too. You know, so it definitely hits a different yeah. way being at the, at the beach and everything. I know. I know. With, with <laughs> Cape Cod, just inundated with white sharks, too. Mm. <laughs> like it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul, you've been doing uh, book tours and stuff. Um, and you and um, Adam Cesar uh, uh, just recently were at Brookline uh, Booksmith. That's where mm -hmm. uh, Brandon was able to yeah. get in touch with you. 
And what has been like the book tour scene like, you know, what is it like to, you know, draw in this audience of people, you know, similar uh, to us that, you know, just fans of the work and just, you know, yearning for more and more horror yeah. novels. Oh, I mean, it's a lot of fun. I mean, this, this summer was the first summer my publisher actually sent me like nationwide, which is really cool. Usually it's been all New England, just things that I can drive to, you know, New York City, maybe a Pennsylvania, if I drive a little further out. But uh, yeah, the summer, like I think I flew on eight planes in 11 days at one point. It was after Boston, I went to Chicago, St. Louis, San Francisco, Portland, Denver, mm. Seattle, which was the wrong order, but that's how it ended up being. So, I mean, I got to see, I'd never seen any of those cities before. So, I mean, that was just, I didn't get to spend a ton of time in many of the cities, which was a little bit of a bummer, but just even to see like downtown Chicago, I've never been, or, you know, see the hills in San Francisco. No one told me Seattle had hills too, because <laughs> uh, <laughs> until I started walking yeah. around. Yeah. So, I mean, the combination of that and just having, um, you know, so many enthusiastic readers come out, it, it, it was amazing. It was a lot of fun. Um I'm going to try to hold on to those feelings as I muddle through these opening weeks of school. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it was definitely cool, you know, to meet you at the um, the bookstore and just having that experience, you know, that was actually my first time going to an event like that. So oh, nice. So it was, yeah, it was really cool. So, um, yeah, that's also, cool. It's fine. The first event I ever went to was at the same bookstore, the Brookline Booksmith. Oh, okay. And it was for an author named Stuart O'Neill, who's since become sort of like a mentor. And when he was first, when he was publishing in the late nineties, he had a few horror novels, but now he kind of just, not just writes, but he writes more like mainstream literary stuff. But no, I was like, a, the book, the, the booksmith is a special place for me. I think Adam said the same thing. Like so many of us Boston people, that's, you yeah. know, the first place that we've been to a book event because it's such a, you know, big indelible store. Yeah. Now, um, with your novel horror movie focusing on like a reboot, what is your favorite reboot of all time? Oh, oh, I was gonna say that's hard, but no, that's that's gonna be an easy one. It's uh, Carpenter's the thing, not the whatever the 2011 thing was. Okay, <laughs> I Please. haven't watched that. I mean, because that does count as a reboot because it is a remake of 19, I think it's 56, is the thing from another world. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a really short list. I can't, I don't know of any. I was other... gonna say, but if you were gonna say another one, what would it be? Because that one, <laughs> I, I, that's so funny. Like, I don't even yeah. actually think of that one as a yeah, reboot, but i know you're right yeah yeah, yeah. But it technically uh, does yeah like if you haven't seen the 1956 one it's you know it's actually it's good it's a good movie it's it's much yeah. different um i was just reading i just finished the audiobook of oh my god let me find my phone um i'll keep talking the audiobook it came out the summer is about the summer of 1982 uh where all these like famous sci-fi horror movies came out in the same year it was the thing blade runner et Mm -hmm. uh wrath of star trek 2 wrath of khan conan the barbarian road warriors like all these movies came out in the same summer so that's why i was able to because usually i'm terrible with dates i was able to just to rattle off yeah yeah uh, all those movies anyway uh the future was now uh was the name of that that book which was a lot of fun okay if you want to dig into those movies yeah otherwise uh ugh, reboots <laughs> like i don't know like you throw out some suggestions because I, um, I tend to be sort of like anti-reboot guy like i don't, I, I, I don't think the halloween ones i don't love brandon and i usually will say evil dead as like oh, one, okay. of our, yeah. one of our top yes. ones yep. mine too yeah <laughs> okay i uh i i love evil dead too so much it's like one of my favorite movies i just haven't I, I did watch Ash versus Evil Dead, so I guess I did watch some of it, but I didn't go back and watch any of the reboots. And I've heard, you know, Fidi Alvarez did a good job, so I, I can I can accept those. But I'm still kind of a gore wimp. <laughs> I heard that the new Evil, <laughs> Evil, the first Evil Dead reboot was super gory, so like yeah, I have yes. to build up to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Paul, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you're a high school mathematics teacher, yeah, and a and a JV <laughs> basketball coach. Um, from my understanding. So, you know, I guess as someone would assume an author would be like an English teacher. Right. Um, and so um, can you, can you explain that a little bit? And also yeah, it's, like, it's... what do your students think about this? Right. Like other life that you have? <laughs> yeah. It's a little hard to explain some ways. Cause I didn't start messing around with writing until I started teaching. Um, so, I mean, the short version is after graduating Providence college uh, with like a, a sort of double major, not really, but it was math and humanities. And the very last, one of the very last classes I took at 
Providence was basically English 101 to fulfill a requirement. So it was me a senior, <laughs> second semester senior in with a bunch of freshmen. But I totally hit it off with the professor. It was almost like one of those stereotypical like dead poet society things. Yeah. Uh, part of it is like we connected over music. He was big into punk and so was I. So he let me like write papers comparing, <laughs> you know, some of the stories that we read to songs and things like that. And, you know, in that class, I read some stories. It's like, wow, I didn't know people wrote things like that. And shortly after that, when I graduated, my girlfriend, who's my wife now, bought me Stephen King's The Stand right before I went I like off that. to grad school for two years. So I went to the University of Vermont for grad school. Nice. Uh, you know, and Lisa was in Boston. So we did the long distance relationship thing. And, you know, grad school is much different than than undergrad. So there wasn't like a lot of partying per se. So I had time to read. And I just fell mm -hmm. in love with, you know, I read all the Stephen King. And through King, you know, I found like Peter Straub and Clive Barker and, you know, and Shirley Jackson, so many others. So like at, I, I definitely had like this creative want, like because I was trying to teach myself how to play guitar too at the same time. So the second half of the 90s, I was very much a hobbyist writer and a hobbyist guitar player. But unfortunately, I figured out I was a better guitarist. I mean, a better writer than guitar player. <laughs> uh, so I sort of, I started selling some short stories in the early 2000s. So I just sort of stuck with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's, I don't know where the math comes in if it does it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think in some ways, uh, I think maybe it's, I'll say this. I feel like, you know, when I'm teaching, you know, I, I'm tired when I come home, but I don't feel like I'm mm -hmm. using the same like writerly muscles. Like, sure. right. If I've so been reading, yeah, if I've been reading like essays or short stories all day or something like that, it, it doesn't so completely I've, deplete you of that. Yeah. Right. Of that right. skill. Are you, are you a basketball player too? Uh, yes. Although like my knees are, are, are traitors. So yeah, I have stopped playing for a couple of years now, unfortunately. Right. I mean, I all still, right. I will, I'm very obnoxious about my shooting ability. <laughs> I, I can shoot the three. Oh, there you go. When I was in high school, I was very sh short and skinny, even though I'm like six four now. Yeah. Because uh, I had a curved spine, which didn't help yeah. the height thing. But right after doing high school, I had back surgery that actually straightened me out three inches. I had like a metal rod, oh, okay. so I went from like this short, skinny outside shooting guard to like a six yeah. four person who could shoot over people. So I was very much a late bloomer in, in the basketball <laughs> sure. realm. Um, no, I, I I mean I definitely enjoyed basketball. It's fun. I, I sort of miss playing, but just physically. Let's get a game going, man. Uh, yeah. We're oh, huge man. basketball fans. I got <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. Let's so do Stephen I've been Graham Jones, for someone if you've read Stephen, yeah. Uh <laughs> you know, I he and I have tried to, around together once. His game's much different than I am. Yeah. He, he he's gonna bully you down on the post. Uh, yeah. I'm much more finesse. I'm just gonna stick out <laughs> by the three point line. There you go. <laughs> so now with you being a coach, what what's your uh, team record like? Did you go in the championship yet? What what uh, tell us well, about that? But, you know, so for JV hoops, like I teach at a private school. So I mean there's no okay. like playoffs or anything like that. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. okay. But we, we had good records. I feel like I, I did a pretty good job, you know. Uh I was maybe maybe some people would be surprised like surprisingly old school for a while as a coach. <laughs> uh, especially when I was younger, like in my you know twenties and early thirties, you know, I taught at a boys' school too, so it was sure. a lot, of, a lot of yelling, a lot of being hard Wait, on people. Are you a Celtics fan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I have to be. I've you know born and raised here. Yeah, <laughs> good um, man, good man. But yeah, my, my so I, I've left the coaching of basketball just because it does take too much time. So I've oh, left. Okay. I think my last year was twenty two. But like mm -hmm. our our record the last few years was like one loss and two loss. So we ended well, okay. which was good. Nice. Yeah. Not bad. yeah, it's funny because I'm a Lakers fan and Dave's a Celtics fan. So we have that uh, rivalry going. Yeah. There. So my, cool. my younger brother, because he's a younger brother, you know, decided <laughs> he was a Lakers fan in the 80s too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have no dogs in that fight. Let me take the line yeah. back. I'm a Grizzlies <laughs> fan because I'm from the Memphis, Tennessee area. And I feel yeah. like a lot of people crap on the Grizzlies <laughs> because they're from Memphis. Yeah. So, but that's my team. But apologies first and foremost, because I was the most horrible math student. Like I had <laughs> that's quite <all> right. <laughs> severe anxiety attacks before tests and everything, yeah. but I managed through it. But I was the student that would come to class every day with a stack of books mm -hmm. from star trek to oh, any wow. horror anything yeah. and everybody was like why don't you put them in your backpack and i like to show off my books <laughs> so my question right now is has a student of yours ever showed up to class reading one of your books and have they <laughs> like you know tried to get you to autograph them or anything yeah. like that you know i haven't uh wow 
Yeah. Well, so typically, I think part of the reason why is typically I teach freshman geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe they're too young for the books. Although I'll see those freshman kids have like a George R. R. Martin or something that's more like high fantasy, less mm -hmm. horror. Yeah, so that hasn't been a lot of horror fans <laughs> uh, in the seniors. But I know some kids have read. I mean, even like there's been a few times where uh, one of the teachers there is assigned like a head full of ghosts to his creative writing class. Actually, my son was in that class. He forced my son to read a head full of ghosts, which was great because otherwise my son wasn't going to read it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, ve I'm very thankful. We, yeah, we had a great conversation. Because uh, my son Cole is much more, he's a much more, he, he's artistic as well, but he's a musician. He makes music. Mm -hmm. He was a music production major in college, a recent graduate. He puts out music under the name Cole Calico. He's a very talented guy. Nice. So it was kind of nice that, you know, that, you know, this, the teacher who made him read my book. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was just a fun conversation we got to have over creativity, but I get it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm his dad. Like, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't want like if he wants to go read more books later that's great but i don't want it to feel like you must read this you know yeah 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 because <laughs> that was funny too because i was gonna ask you with you being a dad what point in your career did your kids start to think you were cool and respect your craft <laughs> <laughs> that yeah you could have to ask them uh for the longest so i have two kids my daughter is now a sophomore at skidmore and mm -hmm. she's a studio art major so so either fortunately or unfortunately, both of my kids are very artistic. <laughs> I think it's fortunate. Um, yeah, my I remember my daughter used to be so embarrassed, like if I brought up the book thing or something, you know, when she was like a, a teen or a tween. Yeah. She's like, why do you even say that? Like, you know, it's like, well, someone mentioned <laughs> Stephen King. I'll be like, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> right, horror too or something. And I, I would do it just to make her cringe. But yeah. no, they, they, they're both definitely proud of, of the stuff that's gone on and um, and it was an amazing thrill when Knock at the Cabin premiered, you know, my kids and my wife got to go and, mm -hmm. you know, that was a lot of fun. My kids actually, so they read, mostly read Cabin at the End of the World on the train from Boston to New York City. They were cramming like they were studying for a test, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just to finish the book before they yeah. saw the movie. My daughter listened to it on audio at like two times the speed. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's the thing I hear people saying they listen to it faster. I guess it makes sense because it's a I little intimidating up, when you see the length. I can get up to one and a half times yeah. and that's yeah. pushing it. Two is like right. crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so you kind of explained why you got into horror uh, in particular, but I'm curious because like I know for me, horror wasn't like the first thing that I ever uh, gravitated to when it came to books, actually like mm -hmm. um Brady Snellis, Chuck uh, Palahniuk, they were huge influences of what got me into reading. Yeah. But, and ironically, they've actually kind of drifted into horror more recently. Yeah. I was going to say, even they're, they're not to interrupt, but they're pretty yeah. horror adjacent, even yeah, when they're not sure. writing horror. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like before that is also like Victorian, like all over the place, like very distant from horror. Mm -hmm. um, but I was curious, do you have any um, books or inspirations that you would consider non horror that kind of even influence what you write now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think like reading Kurt Vonnegut was like a huge deal for yeah. me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, also Chuck Palahniuk as well. But I used to, once I sort of discovered for myself Vonnegut, I used to reread um, Slaughterhouse-Five at the end of every school year. I don't know why it just became like this yeah. little tradition to, to lead me into a, a fun summer. It's not a, you know, it's not a fun book in that way. No. Um, mm. But no, I mean, part of that was like a good lesson, like something like that are, happened to me like fairly early on in the writing process like in the early 2000s when i first started getting serious about the writing thing i had sold a short story and it appeared online and a writer that i respected said hey this is a really good story it would have been great even without the horror element and that sort of maybe stand back or you know step back for a second i was like oh it's like maybe i don't have to force every story to be a horror story my interests are going to go there anyway yeah um i'll just write whatever i think the story i think it should be um I don't know, that was like a really important lesson for me as a writer, just like everything has to serve the story, just to have that mindset. You know, and if I hadn't done that, you know, maybe it took, well, my my career for whatever it is, has been pretty long and windy. Like <laughs> the, the first novel in the 2000s, the first decade, anytime I tried writing a novel, it wasn't horror. It was sort of darkly humorous, but all the short fiction was horror. I mean, it sort of mm -hmm. makes sense because, you know, humor and horror are so closely related. Yeah, It's like, you know, our reactions to the the, the craziness of everyday life. Um, but I never would have like thought to even try writing other stuff. Like my first novels that were published were these weird detective novels in South Boston. Uh -huh. Um, even though, you know, they didn't sell well, but, <laughs> uh, at least I got my first go around with the big publishers 
out of the way. <laughs> uh, and then I got to reboot uh, my, myself, you know, with a head full of ghosts later. Um, so yeah, I, I try to read as wide as, as you know, as possible as I possibly can. I feel like if those, um, the, the detective stories ever got uh, adapted into film, it would be starring Donnie Wahlberg. As the, the head detective. Uh, I, I, I kind of nothing, nothing against Donnie, but no, we, we don't need more. Don, we don't need more Donnie. <laughs> no. Somebody else. Yeah, I feel no. like it's always him, the head southie. Uh, yeah. Well, part of the fun of those detective novels was my, so my wife's family is from South Boston. You know, most people just, you know, I, you know, rightly so, I guess, but you know, just assume everyone's Irish Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, white in South Boston, yeah. whereas like you know Lisa's family. Still white, but uh, Lithuanian. There's a big Lithuanian oh, okay. actually community in South Boston. Like I've been to the Lithuanian club and, you know, there's, you know, Lithuanian churches. So I try to like sort of flip most of the conventions or expectations mm -hmm. of a crime novel by having a Lithuanian narcoleptic I crime detective in South Boston. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Speaking of your writing, um, what's your writing process? Like, I'm pretty sure you get this all the time, but it's like, something that you keep close to your chest. Or are you willing to just, you know, lay it out? for? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wish I could. I wish I was more organized, but typically maybe it's, maybe this is the math part coming in, <laughs> especially yeah. if I'm if I'm working on a novel, like I'll set like a a word count goal of like 500 words a day, but knowing that I'm not going to make that word count every day. So then I break it also like there's days. And then for the week, I'm like, man, if I can get between 2000, 2500 words for a week, that's great. And then I think about the month, if I can get between like nine and 12,000 for the month, that's really good. And I tend to more often hit the monthly goal consistently as opposed to the other ones. Um, you know, cause I, I try to be realistic, especially if it's during the school year, you know, mm -hmm. when things are busy, I don't, I'm already going to be beating myself up as I'm writing anyway. It's like one of the, my, one of the great disappointments in my life is discovering that, oh, I figured that once I sold a few things or if I had sold a few things or things got published, the self-doubts would sort of get easier to go away. And like, they don't, <laughs> if anything, they get worse. Uh, so like having like makeable word counts uh, helps me, you know, just it makes me feel good if I hit that 500. Um also knowing that, you know, typically at the start of a novel, maybe it's only 300 or 350 words or something. And, and the word count tends to, to go up a little bit as I get closer to the end. Um, yeah. And I, if it's a, and if again, if we're talking a novel, I've often spent like a few weeks or, or more before I even start writing, just to try to write an outline, like a plot outline of what I think is going to happen. Um, I haven't done it for every novel, uh, but I always felt like, I still feel the least confident about plot. So I like to have yeah. just sort of like those bare bones there mm. sort of to help me, guide, uh, to help me along, you know, and things will change. And that's sort of the fun part is when, you know, something happens like, Oh, and then like, you know, give yourself permission, obviously to change um, the outline. And sometimes I've been professionally forced to do it. Like if, you know, I usually get like a two or a three book deal. And when the deal's over, my publisher's like, Oh, we want to keep working with you. Mm. You know, we need to see 50 pages in the summary of the next book and we can offer you another deal. So sometimes, you know, the summary happens that way. But I have noticed actually the last three novels I haven't really outlined. I don't know if that means I'm getting lazier. <laughs> I don't think it means I'm getting better. But I kind of outline as I go. Like I keep notebooks and always try to, you know, whatever I'm working on, I'll try to look like at least a few steps ahead to see what might be coming next. Okay. I think yeah, it I, get better. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm just because I mean, horror movie. I told Brandon and everybody. I said uh, Paul didn't have to snap like that because their book had me up all night. <laughs> like I was, I was invested. So hey, oh, thank you. Hearing that yeah. you didn't outline it, oh my god! Just mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, I did have more time for that book because I, I I did take one year sabbatical leave from school. Uh, that, that coincided with knock at the cabin being made mm -hmm. so i wrote i mean i started a horror movie probably like the spring of 22 and finish it january of 23 so i mean that's pretty quick for me usually it takes like a full year so i wrote most of that book when i was off from school so i think you know if it's good <laughs> that helped it being good um but thank you no i appreciate that uh yeah i like that book <laughs> it's yeah. a little weird yeah it was funny because, like I said, when I started to read that book, you know, a lot of the hometown references started to hit a little bit closer. And, and it mm. kind of like took me back to like when I was younger, I was like probably in third grade. 
uh, in school, we had read Avi something upstairs, you know what I mean? And so with that being like based in Providence and kind of going back mm. and forth and then being able to go like on a school field trip and actually see like the building and everything that they reference right. and everything, it's just like, you know, it, it's good to kind of keep like readers locked in because it's like, it's, a, it surrounds you at times, you know? So Absolutely. I think that you do a great job with that because like, well, like you Dave said with the rock and shock and everything having, you know, you know, you know, hot club and all that other stuff put into <laughs> it, you know, it's, yeah. it's pretty cool, you know? So well, some of it, I just hate research. So it's easier just to go with what I remember. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you also stated that your novels are about you wrestling with your own beliefs. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, it's a really good question. I, I think it's hard to like put into words necessarily, mm. but like, I don't know. It, it's fun and weird to be in a place where, you know, I've written a whole bunch of novels now, so I, I can like sort of like look at them as like, these are these chunks of years, <laughs> you know, like for me, a head full of ghosts was 2013. That's when I wrote that thing. And, you know, like, and if I do go back and look at it, which isn't very often or at all, but you know, sometimes you, know, you get asked questions specifically about a book and I have to go back and look at it to remember because I forget character names and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. I'm always interested in like making the characters have like these incredibly difficult choices ultimately. Right. Usually for, for many, not all my books, for, for most of my books, uh, there's almost always like a, a build up to like this big event at like the two thirds point. You know, and that's probably true for most like stories, their structure. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking of like a head full of ghosts. There's the attempted exorcism, um, you know, the cabinet at the end of the world. There's this is terrible thing that happens two thirds of the way through to one of the characters. Um, you know, I think horror movie really builds up to like those last 100 pages where so everything just sort of like starts going to hell, yeah. so to speak. Um, so for me, it's like I, I love maybe it, I love setting up almost like a Rube Goldberg machine because I want to see what the characters are going to do or, you know, what kind of decisions they make. Um, because sometimes I'm not 100% sure. Uh, and all those characters are some little part of me. Like, this is really me sort of just like experimenting or or setting up little terrarium experiments. It's like, oh, what would these versions of Paul do if this happened? <laughs> uh, kind of in a way. I don't know if I answered that very well at all. But it's oh, a no, really good question. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're on point with it. Uh, Paul, can you talk a little bit about um, Cursed Films? Curse films, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it's funny. So many like <laughs> when I had the idea for this book, I had no idea that there were going to be like seven others, <laughs> mm. other like film books come out like within like two or three years. It's it's amazing. It, it's kind of fun that there's something clearly in the zeitgeist where people are plugging into them. Actually, I just started reading an arc now of a of a first time novelist, uh, Michael Weehunt, who's an excellent short story writer, but he has a novel coming out next year called the uh october film haunt okay. uh so yeah it's another sort of like cursed film sort of thing okay um yeah like oh, i have to say, I, I have an answer but i think part of it is me trying to like retrofit an answer um as as to maybe why the cursed film or i don't know like speaking as a fan i don't know if you, if you guys feel the same way but like you know for something that you love like a book or a movie like there's this weird like you like want to read as much as you can about it so i'll go back to jaws like periodically i'll just go down jaws wormholes and like watch youtube videos or watch like the dvd extras i even when i found out that robert shaw wrote like he wrote plays and stuff like i went and found like a a copy on ebay of a play that he wrote written called the man, uh, the man in the glass booth mm. it, just because there's that weird like this piece of art means so much to you like you want to be a part of it and sometimes that manifests into like wouldn't it be cool if it just bled into real life a little bit mm. But it's so weird as a horror fan because actually no, that was some pretty horrific stuff that's happening in that book. We don't want that to be real. Yeah. But I I just think that's just like a natural human reaction to loving a piece of art so much. And so now, you know, in the twenty where are we? The twenty first century, almost a quarter of way through the twenty first century, art in a specific like horror and you know and other genre stuff like there's so much pressure on it and there's so many eyeballs on it, um, and there's so many people who uh say stuff and interact with it like if you go back to the 1800s you write a book like how many reviews do you see how many people do you hear from <laughs> probably mm -hmm. not very many like yeah. 
Uh, but now it's like, there's, you know, obviously Goodreads, any social media platform, like we're just bombarded. And then the conventions that we like to go to, we are talking about rock and shock, et cetera. So I know, I think I just wanted to play around with the idea of like how, how that lore can build because all it takes is like one or two little sparks. And then just like this weird monster of pop culture just sort of like blows it into, blows it up into like this big conflagration now. Yeah. Um, yeah. As far as like having seen any curse films, I don't think I have. <laughs> as far as i know yeah pretty sure <laughs> um going back to you mentioned how a lot of your characters are pieces of you i feel that way too when i write sometimes but yeah. um and i mentioned I, I remember you saying that valentina from horror movie you posted on instagram like this is the inspiration of valentina <laughs> yeah and I was wondering how many characters in your novels are based on actual people because the two main characters of Survivor Song, I was like, I don't know how you got to their heads, but I feel like I knew uh, them. So thank you. Yeah. So I, is, was the, were they based on anybody or? Um, it's funny. Like uh, of all my books, I feel like the characters, like so Natalie and um, Ramola, are. I want to say the. There, there aren't anybody else. They, there. I felt like I felt like I was actually a professional author for once. Like I actually made mm -hmm. up characters. I mean, I'm still putting myself into them, but uh, but as you as you as you noted, from Valentina, like a lot of the times, I'll take people that I know and not their not their personalities because I think that would be weird. But their physical. I mean, that's probably weird too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I tell them I'm I'm borrowing your body or your face or your. And for me, it's like just to have that little bit of like a step stool. But uh, as soon as I have them say something or do something on the page, they become somebody else. So yeah, like Valentina uh, and Cleo are physically based off of two of my my daughter's friends. And I told them and they know. <laughs> and it's been a weird experience for them reading the book. Um, but I don't know, like I, I, as a writer, I think we're all magpies. Like we, we, we try to like build our nests by taking like bits of plastic straw, candy mm. wrapper, whatever. You know, there was a line, uh, I'm, I'm, I am very interested in the line of like where you go too far. Like I, I like when writers write about that part of it. Um, shoot. I was going to say something else, but now it's gone. Oh, um, I, I was only going to mention that when I first met Stephen Graham Jones uh, in the first decade of the two thousands, he happened to be in Providence. We're going to bring him back to Providence. He was, he was doing something at Brown university and we, we had been talking online. And so I met him, we had dinner. It was super cool. And he signed his book for me or a bunch of books. And for like the first five years that I knew him, every book that he signed, he would write, this one's pure autobiography. And I'd be like, Steven, <laughs> there's a time traveling camo Pete in this one. But, uh, <laughs> but as, you know, then later when I was writing more novels, it, you know, in the last decade, I, I sort of more understood what he was talking about <laughs> when he said mm. that. Mm. Okay, cool. And I, I just want to throw out there right quick that while I was reading horror movie that I imagined you as the narrator so did because I. you're tall yes. <laughs> because you're tall yeah. like yeah. i just can't think about else doing it but, but you like. yeah thanks no for sure like i feel like if i'm gonna do horrible stuff to characters that look like them i i have to i have to do worse to characters that look like me so <laughs> it was funny because i had uh recommended that book to my wife because just like the whole beginning of the setup of the film i mean of the book when they're kind of going into it, having the meetings, it reminded me because my wife used to work on film. She was a hairdresser and stuff. Uh. So it seemed like that little friend group there, like she, she hangs out with them still. So I was like, this seems like you Mark. And it seems like Jimmy, you know, like <laughs> when you guys are together, like talking about an old film that you guys worked on or something like that. So you definitely hit it right on the nail with that. So oh, like, thank I you. Say, yeah. But also I just, I want to know, you know, what was your big moment for you when you were recognized by someone that you idolized? Like, you know what I mean? Like that you just had to like talk about, like you couldn't let it go. You had to let everybody in the world know, you know, because those <laughs> things are really big, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, and this is an easy one to talk about because it was April 19th, 2015 <laughs> when uh, Stephen King tweeted about a head full of ghosts. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that remains like a top three sort of professional moment in my life. Like, cause I didn't know it was coming like the, a head full of ghosts had come out in early June, I think it was of, of 2015. You know, and I, I tried to get a book through his, his uh, personal assistant, but she was like, Hey, you know, I'll put this in this room, but it's like a room with thousands of books. And he just walks in and like plucks okay. one, like, you know, you know, you know, 
I can't guarantee he's going to read it. And then I heard from like, I think it was Bev Vincent might have mentioned to me, who, who's you know friends with Stephen, has written books about Stephen, and said, oh, you know, I recommended mm -hmm. your book to him too. So I was like, yeah, now it's like August, school is looming, and I'm bummed out, <laughs> like I am now. Um, so I was like, yeah, you know, he just didn't get to it or didn't read it or didn't like it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when he tweeted, I was home. I was actually moving furniture around the house because we just bought like a new table. So I was like sweaty and grumpy. And then, you know, as the kids say, or used to say, my phone was blowing up and I got teary eyed when I saw that tweet. Like I, I became a reader because of him, never mind a writer. Yeah. So I stopped moving yeah. furniture, just opened my laptop and grabbed some beer out of the fridge and <laughs> just sat and had a one man party for the rest of the night. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's cool because, you know, and then on your, one of your latest books, Joe Hill, his son labeled you as the most terrifying author of your generation. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's cool to see authors support each other and give positive feedback. Um, who are some up and coming authors that impressed you so far? Yeah. So geez, we'll go with another local person, Eric LaRocca, mm. uh, who lives in yes. East Boston, or actually yes. Chelsea right now. Yeah. So Eric, man, he's so prolific. It's, it's, he's almost like out writing being called a new writer. Cause I mean, he's really only been publishing for a few years, but he's already got like what, 10, 11 books out, something yes. insane. Um, Eric is a, it's funny. Like sometimes you read these authors and they and they almost feel like these like fully formed, totally unique visions onto themselves. Like, how do they do that already? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's definitely Eric. I mean, you can see sort of Clive Barker um, influence on him, but mm. Eric writes you know, really grotesque, but beautifully grotesque, grim, difficult stuff. Uh, so Eric is definitely a favorite uh, new writer. Oh. Oh, I'm so bad. I, I started thinking about some... Oh, I, I just read, so let me give you something totally new. His first book hasn't even come out yet. Ale Alex Gonzalez. Mm. Uh, he has a novel coming out, I think, in February or January called Rekt, R-E-K-T. Mm. Um, I would say if you like Eric LaRocca, sort of extreme horror, like you're going to like Rekt. Uh, it's, man, that novel, it's a gut punch. And it, it starts off, it, it involves like the worst videos you could possibly see on the internet, it's just, just as a starting point. But it blows up into this really interesting, um, difficult, you know, well-written story with with an amazing ending. So yeah, I can't wait for people to read uh, Wrecked. Um, yeah, I know. Otherwise, like, I mean, there's, I don't want to like say someone who's is would you know Rachel Harrison be considered new? I mean, she's up to like novel four or five now. I don't know. Mm. Um, there's a Spanish writer, Virginia Fieto, F-E-I-T-O. Her first novel was sort of like quiet horror, mostly mystery, but her second novel coming out again, early 25, is called uh, Victorian Psycho. I think the title tells you everything no, that's cool. that the book is going to be and all yeah. you want, like anything you would want it to be, it, that's it. <laughs> and man, that book was so much fun. Uh, cool. I can't wait for people to read that one too. Awesome. Um, it's interesting, uh, Two weeks ago, I got to do an interview uh, with Mikhail Hallstrom, who adapted Stephen King's 1408. And wow. he described uh, what it was like adapting such a, you know, well-renowned horror author's mm -hmm. film and like kind of like the feeling he got when Stephen King viewed it and shared his um, his thoughts about it. And it was mostly positive. Um, you had uh, The Cabinet at the End of the World, which yeah. uh, was adapted by... In, you know, 2023 by um, M. Night Shyamalan, who, who's like obviously a very well-known filmmaker yeah. uh, and who did Knock at the Cabin. So um, I'm kind of interested in hearing the reverse, what it's like <laughs> seeing somebody like a well-known yeah. you know, filmmaker adapt your work, what it's like to view it. Um, you don't have to tell us, you know, if you like oh, it or yeah. didn't like, I'm not trying to put you on oh, the spot like that, but, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just, I'm so curious to feel like, to know what that's like to see someone else take your work and kind of make it their own, but also, yeah. you know, still yours, your storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a head trip, like in all the, the best in weirdest ways. Yeah. Um, you know, so the movie itself, you know, I like the movie a lot. I, you know, I really don't like the ending. But I kind of like thinking about the differences between the two. Sure. Um, excuse me. My my first time seeing it, <laughs> like I didn't know what to expect, like seeing it for the first time, because I wasn't sent a screen or anything. Like I saw it for the first time at the premiere, you know, with M. Night and the actors and everybody in New York City on the big screen. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, like I visited the set, so I saw a couple of dailies, but that was about it. So, yeah, like 
there were points like when the movie started, like I got teary eyed because you know some of those lines were just right from the book, and mm. but then there were like parts where I was like, oh, I don't know if I could ever watch this again. <laughs> you know, just like this whole range of like emotions. Like I, I there was one point like it wasn't necessarily something that was on the screen. It was just so overwhelming. Like at one point I. I briefly like visualized like getting up and just sprinting out of the theater and sprinting down the streets. I'm like, what would people do if I did that? Um, <laughs> and by the time the movie ended, I was just like sweating. Like I had run yeah. like 10 miles, not that I jogged. So yeah. um, I mean, it was exhilarating, you know, really cool, wonderful experience. And, you know, and just, you know, point blankly, you know, it, it afforded us some financial things. Like I got to leave teaching for a year, you know, it's going to help pay for, you know, some of my daughter's tuition, not all, uh, College is expensive. God damn it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how were, yeah. how so were no. you approached, um, you know, informed that like that right. we want to adapt this and when did you find out who was attached? Yeah. So it was sort of like a stereotypically long, like Hollywood process. Like, you know, it takes, especially when a major studio gets involved, like if it ever happens, it might take five plus years. Mm. That was sort of the case here. It was first option like January of 2018, like six months before the novel even came out. You know, it was, so it was with a producer. And then, you know, for a year and a half, there wasn't much of anything uh, other than they had two screenwriters working on a screenplay. So they, they showed me the screenplay in the spring of 20, no, the spring of 19. Um, mm -hmm. There was briefly two other directors attached, uh, but they had a really small window to get it made. Um, and I really liked those two directors. Um, I, I had no contractual say in anything, but they were really interested mm -hmm. in my opinion and I was, so, you know, the three of us had sort of agreed we should put more of the book into the screenplay than there was at the, that point in time, but it all sort of fell apart. Um, but sort of at the end, there was like some grumbling said, oh, I'm not Shyamalan read the screenplay and is maybe interested in producing it. Um, and then I felt like I heard nothing for a while and then like 2020 sort of happened. But then it started like, no, like I'm not actually, he wants to make it. He has a, a deal in hand, but he's got to finish his movie old first. Mm. so it's like okay that felt like a little bit more like oh weird and my Shyamalan I never would have imagined you know uh <laughs> yeah so then it became waiting it's like okay now it's like the summer of geez 21 old comes out and then he started posting like ah, I'm working on my next thing <laughs> uh and then actually I talked to him on the phone in November of 2011 at that point I think he had already uh 2011 2021 he had already cast a Dave Batista. so that I mean yeah once he started working okay. on it, it just then it went quickly, went but it was, you yeah. know, that was like after like four and a half years of a whole lot of nothing happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, to me, it just seems like a minor miracle. Anything gets made, even though there's so much stuff out there, but because it feels like it takes someone like M. Knight to, to break the paralysis of all these people who sure. are too afraid to say yes. Because if you say yes, it doesn't work. Then, you know, you're the one on the line as a I producer mean, or as a studio head or whatever. This man can get a film made just to spotlight his daughter's singing career. So I guess he can pretty yeah. much yeah. do anything no, in he, a period of I time. Can, <laughs> yeah. And he finances a lot of the stuff himself too. Yeah. I think that's kind of how he, after like uh, those two movies that totally like tanked um, the Avatar Airbender movie and yeah, After yeah. Earth, mm -hmm. when he re sort of restarted with, what was it? The Visit? Yep. He, you know, he sort of bet on himself, which I really admire and like, you mm -hmm. know, put his own money up for that movie. So I think he still does some of that. But yeah. Yeah, no, that's cool. Now, when you were on the phone with him and talking, was there like, you know, as as a writer, you know, when you're going into it and your, um, your book's getting turned into a film, was there like a key piece in, in the book that you said, like, this is what this has to stay? You know, what I mean, because sometimes <laughs> some things are cut out. Like, what was yeah. it for you? Well, I mean, I mean, I would have liked there was something that happened. I would have liked what happens with when to have stayed, but you know, that I appreciated that M night was upfront on that mm -hmm. first phone call. It's like, Hey, these are the changes I'm making, mm -hmm. um, you know, including the title, including the grammatically incorrect title. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, listen, on, on one hand, I feel like I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't say, cause I, it's, well, I am interested in other people taking stories and making their own thing out of it. I mean, I do that as a writer. Like I've, yeah. A head full of ghosts is just like all these horror movies spliced together. Like, I mean, that's so many of the things that I write are, mm -hmm. are start, start with sparks of other things, but you know, I, I'd be lying to you if I wasn't egoless about it. Like, you know, there are parts of the movie I really didn't like, like I said, the ending. No. Um, but I mean, I, I guess that's, you know, that's the trade-off, you know, if, if something else was ever to get made again, 
you know, I, I hope it does. You know, I would like to try to get a little bit, uh, maybe controls the wrong word to have a, a little bit more say, Yeah. you know, depending on what it is and depending on the time, like, you know, if I do go into writing full time, then I feel like I might have more time to mess around with screenplays more than I have. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've done a little, like I've, I've actually worked with a filmmaker trying to expand one of my short stories. And we both like, he wrote most of the script and I rewrote it. So, he, I mean, he did most of the hard work, but so yeah, I have been messing around a little bit more on the, excuse me, on the Hollywood side of things, but well, you can't really bank on it. At least yeah. I can't bank on it, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when the trailer came out because all I heard was like M. Night's new trailer for his new movie came out because yeah. I didn't know anything behind it. And then the trailer started and I was like, this story looks familiar <laughs> yeah and then they kept saying from them i'm like wait a minute no this, this is this is a cab at the end of the world <laughs> i'm like yeah please tell me they're gonna say a novel uh, um, based on the novel by paul J tremblay they, they didn't say nothing and i was like oh i'm i was mad and so i, was, I went on twitter was like <laughs> yo everybody the new m night movie is by paul tremblay go read the book well, thank <laughs> because, <you. Yeah. laughs> because i was a little i was a little upset but i'm like like you said you probably didn't have any um hand in the promotional material or anything like this oh he mm -hmm. definitely has a hand in promotional material oh. i don't but no, no I, I, yeah. I knew you did but yeah, i was yeah. like I, oh I'm no like somebody no, no, should no. say uh, something <laughs> yeah. yeah oh no we, we my <laughs> my literary agent was certainly saying something no so <laughs> i mean that, <laughs> yeah <laughs> listen like it, you know so you guys have read horror movie you know there's a at one point, there's a character, not the thin kid, but I think it's what the nightmare scribe who said his Hollywood agent says, oh, I'm going to pitch you as a creator because no one respects writers out here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was something that my Hollywood rep said to me that I thought he was joking at the time, but he was not. Oh, wow. So I don't know. It's weird. I, I would say the. And yes, like for me, like that the movie was different than the book that's like small potatoes compared to the frustration right. that i had with what you were talking about i, I was very frustrated with the six months leading up to the release of the movie that they were actively trying to hide uh that it was an adaptation of the book but i don't know it, hollywood just were, operates so differently like you would think mm -hmm. hey maybe having the people who read the book you know that might offer a little bit of momentum a little bit of like people saying yay as opposed to people being yeah. like huh yeah. Right. Uh, so, I, but I, but I don't I don't run a studio, so I don't know. Uh, yeah. Speaking of studios and everything, I wanted to know if you had the opportunity, you know, with the stuff going on with the Jason franchise and Wes Craven's estate getting the rights back to a Nightmare on Elm Street and stuff like that. If you had the opportunity to dive into any existing franchise or maybe pick up somebody else's novels once they maybe leave this earth, who would it be? Yeah. Ooh. Um, I'm such an X-Files fan. Like I would love to do like a X-Files monster of the week. Not, not the big sort of conspiracy mm. stuff, but I always liked the, you know, the, the episodes that were like contained. Yeah. Like one story right, it was about yeah. this one monster, like do yeah. an X-Files movie like that. Or I don't know. I, I would, I mean, one of my favorite writers working now is Mariana Enriquez. I would love to try to adapt, <laughs> to be in on the adaptation of, of something of hers. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, those are the only ones that come to mind. Like, I'm not much of a, of a slasher guy, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be the right guy. I mean, I watch it. Partly is that because of my ongoing competitiveness with my brother. My brother is a big slasher guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Stephen Graham Jones has got the slasher thing. If anyone's gonna, you know, yes. be, if anyone's gonna be allowed to, like, you know, go back to the to those franchises, it should be him. Hmm. So I think I'd have to find something else. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. But it's like I love Creature from the Black Lagoon, but it already sounds like James Wan is doing that. Yeah. But you know, honestly, but... most of me is like, uh, like what what came before is too perfect. Although you know, I, I take that back. Maybe. The movie Them, the giant ant movie, 1954. Okay. Wow, it's yeah. such a great movie. Like, I just <laughs> yeah. watched, rewatched it with my daughter, her seeing it for the first time, and she really loved it. Um, yeah, I'd be in on a, some sort you, of. And you mentioned, movie. didn't you mention like Killer Shrews at the beginning? Like, yeah, I that's feel such like, that's... like a silly, that, but that's bad. Like, I don't think I could, <laughs> I don't think anybody could make Killer Shrews. I mean, you could make it like a comedy, like a purposeful horror comedy, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add in, you know, Towards the end, well, at the end of horror movie, you had touched on, you know, bringing the thin kid back 
to be in the reboot and you know like going through how they were going to use him and it just it, it definitely hit to me like kind of like for the remake of Candyman when mm. uh they were bringing Tony Todd in and you know a lot of people had negative reviews on like how they used him it wasn't enough but I to me I, I thought it was just enough because they didn't just go over and just do too much with him so it was kind of yeah. just like like you know with the thin kid it left it open-ended like what they were going to do with him and everything like that but I think that was cool and like you did you see the remake of Candyman I have to admit I haven't well you you yeah. hit right on the head because oh, I? Like, I, oh, okay. I, I felt like it was right there and then because it was just like you know like everything that was Tony was going through with that just the the ending how they how they use them so it kind of just mm. it, it made me think of that when um while reading it so that was huh. cool so could we see another book to a horror movie novel because <laughs> it, it kind of just left the door open yeah know? i don't know like I, I mean my knee-jerk reaction would be to say no but like i guess you okay. never know like it would have yeah. to be a story that like is really compelling yeah um just like as a reader and a viewer like a, as a reader i don't really read series like you know, I've read Stephen Graham Jones's because he's Stephen Graham Jones, but like I, I was never somebody who was like, oh, I want another book of this. I like, mm -hmm. I like single contained things, even if it hints to like another story down the road. Sometimes I like leaving it open like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. That said, though, like, <laughs> uh, I do like having, I imagine little connections in between my books, like the Paul Bears Club. You know, the main character Art Barber is very much physically described as me. It takes place in Providence, and I kind of feel like you know, the thin kid <laughs> is maybe arts like dark side or darker side mm -hmm. in some ways. Uh, and there's like, this doesn't mean it's him, but there's a point in the screenplay. If you go back to it, where one of the characters almost says the thin kid's name. And then this, in the screenplay, it says a dash dash. Oh, okay. Maybe it's art or maybe it's, I don't know, Arnold <laughs> <laughs> or some other a name. Um, yeah. And so the, the novel I just started now actually has another, role for uh a tall old lanky person with even less lines <laughs> than this book <laughs> okay. so we'll see <laughs> okay. Dave, so, all right yeah um well paul thank you for joining us today this was an absolute honor yeah, thank uh, you my really, pleasure we appreciated this conversation um can you tell everybody um, where to find you on social media, if you have any upcoming events, anything like that? Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm pr most the most active on Instagram these days, at Paul G. Tremblay, uh, Twitter, or X, or whatever we call it, is at Paul G. Tremblay as well. Um, what do I have coming? So a couple of local events. I'm actually going to be with Eric LaRocca, Christopher Golden, and some other writers. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting their names, in a bookstore in Winchester on... September 17th. Hmm. Um, there's going to be a Boston Public Library event later in October. Um, I'll be at the Saratoga Book Festival in Saratoga Springs. It's a nice okay. cheat for me because my daughter goes to school in that town, so it's an excuse to go see yeah, her. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I was almost going to say one thing, but they haven't announced that I was going to be there, so I shouldn't <laughs> say anything about that one. Oh, the most fun one, especially for New England guys, sorry, Marcus, uh, but you should come out to New England, uh, <laughs> is the the, the Merrimack Valley Halloween sort of uh, festival, they call it. It takes oh. place in Haverhill. Uh, and they, they get like uh, more than 50 horror writers there just in the Haverhill library. It's just horror writers standing next to tables selling books. And it's a lot of fun. Cool. They usually, cool. you know, so I'll be there this year. Uh, but they always Is that have, like, on Halloween or, or around no, Halloween? No. Uh, let me look at the calendar on my phone. Definitely have to go down and check that out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Haverhill is like almost on the New Hampshire border. It's, yep. you know, so it's Northern Mass. Yeah. I think it's, is it the 26th? Is it the 19th? It's the 19th. Okay. October yeah. 19th. Yeah. October 19th. Cool. Locked that in. sounds fun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, make sure you catch Paul out at some of these events. Uh, <laughs> follow him on social media so you can track him down and yes. uh, tell him everything <laughs> you want to tell him. <laughs> yeah. Please do. Uh, <laughs> or challenge him to a game of basketball because I know that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> It'll have to be horse now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, I'm with you. All right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks again, Paul. It was a pleasure having you. Everybody, make sure you check out Horror Movie um, and let us know what you think. And we will see you next week. Everyone have a great night. See ya. Thanks. Thanks.